Good evening. It is it is 5.59 now. It's 6 o'clock. There we go. Um, and I am calling our special meeting to order. Uh, first, we're going to have roll call. Um, at this time, I will ask each board member to um, declare their presence after I say your name. Director Song? Here. Director Cook? Present. Director Clark? Present. Vice President Farah? Present. And myself. And Vice President Farah, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Oh, please join me. Good evening. Welcome everybody around our very large table today. <laughs> um, this is a meeting of the Kent School District Board, which is held in public to comply with the Open Public Meetings Act. The purpose of this special meeting is a joint meeting between the Kent School District Board of Directors and the Covington City Council. Welcome, we're so glad to have you join us today. We welcome our special guests from the city of Covington and thank those of you who have come to this meeting and those who are viewing our live stream. Um, Director Song, could you read the land acknowledgement for us? Sure. Uh, we acknowledge we are gathered upon the ancestral lands of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe who historically lived throughout the area between the Cascade Mountains and the Puget Sound. Thank you very much. To get to know each other a little bit better, I'm going to ask um, or invite the elected officials and senior staff to introduce themselves, share their name, title, and one or two. You can choose one or two. Um, words to illustrate your why. I think we all could get really wordy, so we're going to try to keep it short. So, um, would you like to start, Wait. Sure. Uh, Wade. <laughs> Gotta remember these mics. Uh, Wade Berenger, I'm the Deputy Superintendent of the Kent School District. And one or two words to illustrate my why. Opportunity. I guess my one or two words of why is my girls, so that's two, and then making a difference in the city. Did you say you could have two? Yep. Okay, you have two. <laughs> I, would did, I did four, so I did not listen. <laughs> I'm Regan Boley. I'm the Covington City Manager. My why is love. I'm Tom Smith. I'm the Oops. Use the mic. Sorry. I should have stated that and pass it. I'm Sean Smith, I'm the Mayor Pro Tem of Covington, and uh, I guess I, my why I'm here tonight is to find common ground and, and solutions, so. Hi, my name is Christina Soltis, Covington City Council, and I'll, my why is, the two words would be the future of families, so future and families. I am Debbie Hartsock, um, Covington City Council, and my why is community. I am Jennifer Harjahausen, City uh, Council Member of Covington, and I was also going to say community and connection. Uh, I'm Joseph Samomo, Covington City Council, and I'll say my family. Uh, Don Bondren, I'm the Public Works Director of the City, and uh, service. My name is Ben Rarick. I'm the Associate Superintendent of Finance, and um, my why will be opportunity for kids. Uh, Damon Hunter, Associate Superintendent of Human Resources, uh, and my why would be KSD students. I'm Naomi Zantello, Executive Assistant to our Board of Directors, and my why is students and families. Good evening, my name is Faith Sicily and I'm the Director of Communications here in the school district. And my why is I have four kids that graduated from this district. It's a wonderful district, it's way more than two words, but it's all about students and families and communicating. So. Hi, I'm Carolyn Curry, I'm the Assistant to the Superintendent. Uh, my why is education and perseverance. Hi, I'm Spencer Pan. I'm the Senior Executive Director of Accountability and Strategy here. And my why is similar theme to others, students. 
Good evening, I'm Brian Smith, the Director of Athletics and Activities. Uh, my why is waking up every day trying to make a difference. Hello, Randy Heath, uh, Associate Superintendent of Learning Sports, and my why is around healthy communities. Oh, are we going to? Yes. Oh, uh, Andy, School Board Director, um, opportunity and um, change. So I'm Donald Cook. I'm uh, here as School Board Director as well. And uh, my why is because, uh, you know, I want to give back after um, my kids being the fifth generation in this uh, school district. I want to try and give back. Tim Clark, Board of Directors, Awareness and Caring. Awali Farah, Vice President of Kent School Board. My why is gratitude to serve this community. Beth, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Porter Covington, the City Council Member. And my why is support and community. Okay. And I think I'll finish it up, Megan Margell. Uh, President of Kent School District Board of Directors, and mine is paying it forward and love. I'm going to steal that from somebody else who had it, and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Um, Dr. Ranger, you want to lead us off? Am I leading you off in, in introductions for presentations or um, 2.01? Let's start with 2.01. <clears throat> Fabulous. Thank you. Um, 2.01, just welcoming everyone here this evening. Um, thank you for being with us, uh, all of our um, Covington City Council members uh, that were able to join us, as well as the Director of Public Works, um, our board members, as well as our staff here in the Kent School District. Uh, it's a great opportunity every year to be able to come together uh, in a joint meeting like this where we can share um, our commonalities uh, as, it, as it meets the needs of our community and our students and our families that we serve, uh, specifically in this particular area from Covington. And so I'm um, looking forward to hearing the presentation this evening from Covington about the great things you guys are doing for our community. And I look forward to sharing uh, the great things that we're doing here in the Kent School District as well. And so we can continue to uh, foster this partnership and move forward together. And um uh, we were talking at work about um, people saying the same thing just over and over, and so I'm not going to repeat everything that we have. Uh, our new saying is just saying plus one. So I'm going to do a ditto or a plus one, uh, but very much excited to have City of Covington appreciate how um, our two organizations get to work together so much and um, very much value um, the partnership that we have and so many different endeavors that we're looking at. So thank you for being here, and we're looking forward to hearing the presentations tonight. Uh, well, I look forward to our joint meeting every year that we have to hear more about what the school district is doing while we'll still stay in touch on a regular basis, just getting a more thorough update that we hear. And it's a pleasure to sit down and not just with our school board, but everybody else with the school district and uh, just get updated on what's going on. So thank you. Do you have anything you'd like no. to add? Okay. It's hard to follow Wade. <laughs> I know. We can just do a plus one. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Speaking of, um, 3.01, um, Mr. Berenger, would you, uh, Dr. Berenger, you'd like to lead us off on presentations? Sure. Um, I would like to introduce Ms. Simone Hamilton, our Director of Equity and Strategic Eng Engagement, to start us off with our first presentation this evening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Berenger, and good evening, everybody here. I'm not going to go around and say everybody's name, but um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and I'm excited to share with you, because as you're going to have a lot of robust discussion about what's taking place within our, spe our specific parts of the, of the region, both as a city council and as a school district, I want to kind of ground us into like who the work is for and where the work happens in KSD across. So kind of really answering this question, who is Kent School District? I know that when I came here, I previously worked in Bellevue School District, which is not necessarily the biggest district, but it's also not the smallest district. And I had an idea that Kent was bigger than Bellevue. I didn't realize really how big Kent is till you're here. And some really unique things about Kent that I'll point out as we go to that I think um, 
provide us with unique challenges, but also afford us the opportunity to develop some really complex and sustainable solutions that can have a big impact. So first to start, um, KSU schools and kind of looking at student enrollments, so we have over 25,000 kids. Um, and we really tether around that 25,000, you know, the hundreds might go up and down, but that's really where we're at as a district right now. Um, and those kids are spread across 44 different schools, it includes elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools, also some of our choice academies, and some of the other supportive um, kind of open door school programs that we have to ensure that kids are not falling in the gap, but that we're really setting them up to succeed um, and thrive later on in their life, even if the conventional schooling route doesn't necessarily fit their needs along their way. Um, we also do that across 72 square miles. And I think one thing to call out to talk about what's big is that this district spans seven municipalities. I came from a district where it was like Bellevue School District is in the city of Bellevue. It's pretty much what it is, you know, and, and that's kind of how it works even in Seattle to a degree. Seattle School District's huge, but it's all one municipality. Kent is unique in having seven that we're constantly having to be in community with, build relationships with, understand the different needs as we make decisions. But as a result, it makes no decision, an easy decision or a quick decision, having to get permissions or check in with the various stakeholders. Um, also in there too, just to note that we are the fifth largest district uh, in Washington, which thinking about how big we are in the different metro areas, that's a pretty high up there as far as being in that top five range of our size. Which then brings me to, so we know the area that we cover, but who is in those areas and what makes up our community, which is really like our students and families. So we have over 16,000 families across this district. And of those, across those 16,000 plus families, over 130 languages spoken. So I always have deep empathy for Faith and her team, knowing that anything we try and do, any type of communication that we have, thinking about the complexities and the nuances and the ways you have to navigate, not only what we're gonna say, the different ways we have to say it, and then, then how are we gonna engage in that two-way dialogue? So we're not just telling, but that we can engage in that back and forth, knowing the linguistic diversity that exists here. Um, our top three languages are English, Spanish, and Punjabi. But again, mind you, those are the top three out of over 130 that we have. And another challenge, too, that you have even linguistically is it's not enough, it's not enough always to just translate materials, given that people's levels of literacy, even in their home language, varies. Just because someone might speak a certain language doesn't mean they necessarily read in that same language or have the ability. So again, adding different complexities, um, but also opportunities for how we engage and build relationships with our families. Uh, more than 72% of our students come from culturally, racially, and ethnically diverse backgrounds. Another way to say that is over 72% of our students are non-white. And so when we think about the larger base across the municipalities, understanding who the families and the students are of our district, those are things that we take into consideration and really prioritize when we make decisions and are looking at the impacts of the programming, um, of changing programming, you know, you name it, but we have to consider all these different things while also taking into account historical experiences and historical impacts of different communities, particularly within the education system. And then lastly, kind of a breakdown of what that multiracial or what that racial breakdown in ethnic diversity is. Um, and that you can see that there isn't necessarily an overwhelming amount of representation from each group, which I think is a beauty, in that there is so much diversity even within some of those racial groups. What we even um, categorize as Hispanic or Latino, for example, I was just at a school, and they take it a step further, and they actually track home countries. And what we grow, what looks on one data set as just Hispanic Latino is now 20 different deviations from 20 different countries of what that then impacts of what their needs are, um, how they came to this country, what their current status is, um, and how to support them. And so those are all the things that we're taking into consideration uh, and trying to balance and make decisions around and find win-wins or find ways to not cause more harm and to meet the needs um, while also still pushing and propelling ourselves forward as a system. Next is kind of then, so when we have these students and families, who is that that takes care of them? Who is that that sets them up for success? Is what I like to think about this slide as, and that's really our staff and our teachers. Staff in this room, um, building uh, teachers and staff out at the buildings, we're all working together to try and meet those needs of all those different families and students in our district. We have over 3,800 staff members, which is quite a bit, and six, over 1,600 of those are actually classroom teachers which is also a, a large number as well in comparison to other districts. And 57% of our teachers have master's degrees, so we have some really exceptional and qualified staff that is working with our young people to set them up for success. 
Um, another interesting statistic is to look at just kind of the gender breakdown of our, fem of our teachers and recognizing that traditionally, probably not surprising, that the teaching workforce is more female, um, there's more representation from females in that workforce. And so when we look at trying to diversify our workforce, when we're looking at doing analysis, we're not limiting things to just race or just gender, we're looking at the intersectionality of things and ultimately trying to get to a point where our students see ourselves, no matter who they are, reflected in the adults in the building for them. So the diverse student body that exists in our school buildings, we, we aspire to have that same diversity represented in the staff that's serving them. Because we know how powerful it is when one student can make a connection to one adult. And sometimes that can happen across affinity or likeness for them. But in the absence of that connection, we know some of the devastating impacts that can happen for them and subsequently for their families and for their future. And then on the right, you can see kind of just the racial breakdown of the teachers. And you can see that there is disproportionality in what teachers are represented um, or the racial identities of the teachers in our district. And the, ideally, you would have a little bit more parity, knowing that our white students only make up about 20, about 20 ish percent of the population, but majority of our teaching staff, a little over 80%, is white. Um, and it's not to say that you can't teach across cultural difference, it's not to say that you can't teach across racial difference, but again, back to that affinity, back to that ability to make connections and understanding, um, and having that likeness and comfortability comes with having people that share similar cultural, racial, gender, not only backgrounds, but experiences as you as well. Um, and just another thing to note too is that, you know, on average our teachers here have about 11 and a half years worth of experience. So which is great because then it's not too much of new teachers, but not also a bunch of teachers who have been in the profession and are starting to plan for retirement and experiencing a gap in the system. We have a large portion of teachers that have been teaching enough years to develop some really strong instructional practice and skills to meet the needs of our students, but also can provide mentorship for new coming in, but still can learn from some of those that have um, wisdom that have been teaching for a while. Some of the academic supports that we have in place that we encourage, um, or that you know, we expect our staff and all of us to work together to offer to our kids is in around inclusive education, about 12.7% of our students receive inclusive education services. About 25.6%, so a little bit over a quarter of our student population receive English language services, or also known as multilingual learners, uh, and the program's built around that. We also have about 8.2% of our students that are enrolled in the highly capable program. And this is one of those areas too that we do some deep equity work. I work with the teaching and learning team to look and make sure that the students that are making up that group are also representative of the diversity across the system. Um, and then lastly, our dual language program, which is really great here that starts in elementary school and has pathways all the way to high school, having over 650 students enrolled in that um, is really powerful. And again, when we think about one of our first strategic goals being preparing kids to be global citizens, that linguistic component of being able to be multilingual and to learn and develop that at a young age is crucial and I think gonna be an invaluable skill for them later on in life. And yeah, again, like I said, there's, there's so many more things I could share with you, but I also just wanted to kind of ground the conversation today as you talk about the what is happening. This is really to offer you kind of the where that stuff is happening and the who it's happening for. So with that, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Yeah. I'm gonna throw that over to uh, Dr. Beringer, who I think would be able to connect the microphone. us. So she can repeat the question. Oh, it was about, to speak more about what's included in inclusive education okay. services. Yeah. We just want to make sure we can get your voice on. Oh the, yeah, the on the thing, yeah, sorry. That was the question. Live, so. YouTube Live, that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, um, what's all included in the 12.7% of inclusive education services? Sorry. Yeah, so we serve in the Kent School District students um, from, multi, uh, from multiple um, abilities and disabilities. So we've got students in several different programs. We have an integrated program uh, that we have for students that are within two years of grade level. We have a program that's called our Support Center Program for students that are more like three to five years off grade level um, in their, their cognitive ability. Uh, we've got uh, a, a, a adaptive support center program that serves students that are quite a bit removed from grade level in their physical and cognitive ability um, in those spaces. We've got a school adjustment program 
which are students that um, their IEPs meet their, their needs under behavior. We've got a LINK program that works and supports students um, with autism that are on the spectrum. So we've got quite the range of programs uh, within the district. Now, we don't serve um, all those programs in every single school <clears throat> because it, it, we wouldn't be able to staff all of those programs. So depending on the level and the number of students, um, we try to provide programs as close to their uh, neighborhood schools as possible. Other questions? I was wondering, um, do you know, do you happen to know what the, um, I guess the trajectory has been over time, like what the change in uh, the racial demographic from, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago up until today? Uh, if you look on OSPI, they show some trend graphs, which is where a lot of this data comes from, and you will see that probably over the last 10 to 15 years in particular, the district has become more diversified, um, and you've seen more of an increase in some of the other areas. There was never, you know, you have to go way, way back to see like when there was arguably a, a majority white student body that was here. You have to go back a couple decades. But in the last 10 to 15 years, when you look at the data, you will see slowly, steadily increases of more representation from students and families um, of different racial and ethnic backgrounds that are non-white. Is there like um, any correlation of that with like, because you mentioned that there are 80% of our teachers are white. And uh, is there a correlation of that, you know, where um, maybe 30 years ago there was a, a much higher population of, of white students and because of that there are more students that come back and uh, work as teachers in our district. And maybe, you know, hopefully I would, I would assume we go towards the direction of more diversity as the same students that are there now maybe come yeah. back and want to work in Kent as well. Historically, the teaching profession has been dominated by white women, and that was further exasperated after the Brown versus Board of Education, because even though schools were integrated and students were integrated, teachers were not. Black and brown teachers were left out of that process. And so there was a diversification of schools, but not a diversification of the workforce. So absolutely, there may be some students that identify as white that have come back and taught and contributed to that, but there also hasn't been national-wide efforts, and particularly in regions um, more in the Pacific Northwest or where there isn't larger populations of uh, black people or black centers that you would maybe see on the East Coast or in the South that educators of color are not are not being developed or um, going back into the pipeline. And I think I always, you know, talk with young people and it's like if you can, right now we're celebrating Women's History Month and so we're doing some cool stuff with kids and listening to these young girls talk about like, I don't know, I could be that or I don't know. And it's like, if you can see her, you can be her. And I think representation really matters. And I think that for a long time and even currently in our data, Black and brown kids don't see themselves represented as a teacher. They don't see that as something that they could be. And often if they've had adverse experiences in school, some people take the route of I'm gonna go back and be different and change that. And others are like, I'm never, I wanna stay as far away from that as I can. So I think it's a yes, that maybe is. But I think if you look historically and certain federal level policies and things that are in place is that teaching profession has been dominated and continues to be dominated by white women. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yeah. Yes, oh, please. Apparently, I'm the only one with questions today. Um, can I ask one more question? The Kent School District is really large, and that can be a beautiful thing, but that can also come with its challenges. Has there ever been consideration, for, for example, on days like snow days, when half of Kent is okay, the other half, or even a smaller portion, is not, the entire school district closes? Has there ever been consideration to make may, maybe like a west and an east? Um, sections of the, the entire school district or north and south, but has, has that been brought up? Because that, it doesn't, it, it's so big that maybe that would be effective. Great question. Um, I can say that, uh, that every now and then a conversation has popped up, not necessarily for <laughs> inclement weather, um, but I know even when we were doing the boundary work, um, there was a couple comments that were made by citizens in the community about why don't we just split the district or why does it be so big, why don't we just, you know, uh, have two districts or whatnot. When you think about inclement weather, um, we've got a lot of pieces. We've got the south um, east that is in the foothills, so you've got the Maple Valley, Covington, Black Diamond area, of three of the 
municipalities that we serve. Then you go all the way north up to Fairwood, which then also can lead out through Petrovisky out towards Maple Valley as well. So when you think about starting to cut or if you were to, to kind of work, where would you divide it, um, the, the t topography of the school district, especially around weather, is, well, the valley may not see what everyone on the East mm -hmm. Hill west or east sees. Mm -hmm. So dividing it maybe at the Benson would, for weather purposes might be the only, only way to do that. And then it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's not necessarily a, um, an equal in number of students and community that we would serve. So I would say that we haven't had the conversation around inclement weather. Uh, it is big, um, but you know we, we love all of our kids and, and we'll take care of all of them. And not that you were saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying yeah. divide the right. into two districts. I mean, within the same district, but just, and it doesn't, that was just an example for inclement weather. My hope is that the details aren't lost for such, specifically for our kids, because we love them, mm -hmm. that we pay attention to what every school needs. And, and it, as, as we said in the beginning, we're you know meeting our needs. Are we meeting our needs? And what can we do just to be open-minded and to say, hey, maybe there's something we can do to make this a little bit more equitable mm -hmm. as far as our needs. So just food for thought, but I um, yeah. thought I'd plan to see. Thanks. Any other additional questions? Well, Ms. Hamilton, can I ask, what is your why? One to two words. Oh. <laughs> um, Plus one. <laughs> no, um, I think I think love and gratitude. What you said, love, really resonates with me. I think you know this this job is hard. Working in schools is hard, and I'm sure working on the city council is also is hard. But um, there are days where you can feel like, did I do anything? Like, <laughs> did I make it? Like, not even did I make it worse, but like, did I do anything? And I think it's the gratitude that students and their families depend on us and keep showing up, and then the love I have for trying to meet those needs. Um, you know, the Maasai Mara people in Kenya, they have this saying that when they greet each other, they say, how are the children? Uh, they measure the health of a society off of how a children are doing. It's not how are you, how are th it's how are the kids. And I try and approach the work here that same way as how are our kids. And measuring the health and the effectiveness as us as adults in our roles and as a community and working collaboratively on how our students are doing. So I know that's more than two words, but. Well, I think you just got so. a plus 20 yeah. <laughs> um, from all of us here. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Much appreciated. And now we move on to section 3.02, and I call on to Dr. Berenger again and for his presentation. All right. We'll wait as we transition the PowerPoint slides. As we're getting that set up, again, appreciate the opportunity to be with our partners in the Covington City Council this evening to be able to share, you know, some updates of the last time we met. Um, we met last year, and during this time last year, um, we were going through a lot of things in the school districts. We were getting ready. Uh, we, were, we were addressing uh, the boundary changes that were going to be coming up beginning this school year. We were addressing moving sixth graders to middle school for the first time. Um, we were addressing the 2023 bond that we were going out for in April of 23. And um, <clears throat> we were addressing uh, the strategic plan that we'd put on hold during uh, interim superintendent uh, Vela's year two years ago um, and working on that. So we had a lot of strategic initiatives that we were working on uh, last school year. So we shared an update as we were in the middle of all of that last year. and want to give you a quick update on, on those items this evening, um, as well as um, something that's big and coming up for us here in the uh, very near future in the Kent School District. So, let's see, there's that. I just shared those pieces. So, let's talk about uh, a little bit about that middle school transition. So, when we met last year, we were going through and talking about the impact of the boundary changes, and we had several opportunities for our community to be involved and engage in community forums around our boundary changes. Um, I know Joe was involved in a lot of those and we appreciate his voice and being in those spaces. <clears throat> it's all good, Joe. It's all good. We, you know what? No, no. Yeah. 
I, I, you know what, I, I, I think community voice is really important. Yeah. Whether we always agree it. on everything, yeah. the fact is that he showed up <laughs> yeah. and he was persistent and that's important. You know, and so there's a lot to get behind when people are persistent and they have questions. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all good with that. Um, so we were working through the boundary change for 43 of our 44 schools in the Kent School District, um, as well as uh, what does it look like to move sixth graders to middle school? And, and the transition for not only students, but parents and for staff as well. Um, it's not as just easy as moving 2,000 sixth graders to middle school and, and say, oh, you're all gonna be fine. They're doing it all around the country. It's no big deal. Um, there were a handful of parents that were a little uncomfortable with what, what that transition might look like and feel like for their kids as well as for them as parents, kind of letting go and allowing them to uh, enter that middle school lifestyle with now seventh and eighth graders as well, um, as well as teachers. Not all teachers uh, went into education to be middle school teachers. If, you've, if you're parents and you've had, if you have a middle schooler or have had a middle schooler, that's the, that unique time frame in their lives that, you know, it's not the, the elementary student that's, that's like wants to sit on your lap and snuggle with you, it's the middle school student that uh, has got a lot of stuff going on. It's where they're trying to find themselves. And so um, we spent a good deal of time all last year uh, putting several committees together um, for our middle school transition um, that allowed staff, students, parents, community members to come together and work out solutions on what would be best for our students to be able to support them as they transitioned into sixth grade um, after the boundary change. And so um, it was a great opportunity uh, for us to learn a little bit more about what a successful middle school looks like as well as what does sixth grade in middle school look like. And so we had three committees uh, that were created by our, our middle school <clears throat> uh, team last year that supported this transition. We had the activities or ac academics and electives committee that focused on advanced courses in lab science, the multi-tiered systems of support, uh, alignment of sixth grade, um, sixth through eighth grade learning standards, and then the elective opportunities for kids. Because when students left elementary at sixth grade, when they were sixth graders in elementary, they didn't have access to the level of electives and, and course offerings that they do at the middle school level. Um, and so this was a great opportunity to, to engage our students for the first time in some of those elective opportunities. We also had student activities in athletics, uh, which focused on equal access around interscholastic inter sports, we added a robust intramural program to our middle schools as well. So we wanted to make sure that our middle school students, specifically our sixth graders, not only had access to a majority of the varsity and junior varsity sports, but they had access to intramurals <coughs> if they were not up to the level or felt comfortable competing at, at that level. And so um, increasing intramural opportunities, not just for the sixth graders, but also for the seventh and eighth graders now who want to have access to those um, type of opportunities as well the role of community programs, and then of course clubs and activities, increasing club and activity opportunities for our kids. And then our last uh, group was our transitions and support. So thinking about the transition activities. Last year in the spring we did um, a moving up day for all of our sixth graders to be able to go to the middle schools that they were gonna be attending and to see teachers, to meet students that were already at the middle schools, to be able to understand what middle school life was like um, and so they had an opportunity to do that last spring, uh, coupled with some opportunities this summer before the school year started for our incoming uh, sixth and seventh graders um, to be able to engage in some activities around what middle school is like as well. Um, working on ongoing supports and transition and then the emotional support. So we, we spent a lot of time um, digging into what does social emotional supports look like, not just for all of our students pre-K-12 in the Kansas School District, but specifically for our sixth and seventh grade students who are transitioning for the first time to a middle school into a much larger space, into 55 minute class periods, which is different than what they're used to at the, the elementary level, um, and really working through what does that mean and what does that look like and feel like to our students as well as our staff. And then also bringing our parents along side of us as we did that work. Um, that could be very overwhelming for students and parents as well as staff and so we took a lot of time, as I said, throughout last year putting that together. I'm happy to say that um, we've come back at the beginning of the year, and I would say roughly uh, October, November, 
Um, we were watching very closely as we began the beginning of the year, not only for all of our students that were impacted by the boundary changes, but specifically for our sixth and seventh graders as they moved into middle school and how they were able to acclimate themselves to middle school life um, as well as our families. And um, through our surveys that we've done about how are you doing, how are things going, you know, what do you enjoy most about middle school, uh, overwhelming support and um, positive responses from our students about their middle school experience as well as parents being appreciative of the transitional supports that we put in place both in the spring of prior to going to middle school and then in the summer as well as the beginning of the year with open houses and things like that. So um, with any large scale adjustments like this to districts of this size, you're going to have your bumps, you're going to have your uh, things that are going to pop up, but uh, I believe our staff, our students, our families, and our community uh, gave grace and were responsive to those to make sure we can address those in a timely manner. Um, and I think as we get ready to go into the 24-25 school year, and we've got a full year under our belt with our boundary change as well as our middle school transition, we're in a really good place to have an excellent year next year, learning from the things that we learned this year. And so i um, super excited about that, and that's gone really well. The other big piece that I mentioned earlier um, that we put on hold the strategic plan. The strategic plan ended when Dr. Watts left. Uh, that was the end of that particular year of the strategic plan. And then when uh, Superintendent Bella came on board as the interim, we decided at that time, not knowing who the permanent superintendent was going to be, that we would pause the strategic plan, continue to work on uh, and, and work from the strategic plan that was in place for the previous leadership as we then put in place a plan to address what does the new strategic plan look like for the Kent School District that would take us from 2023 to 2028, so our five-year plan. And so we spent a good amount of time all last year with staff, parents, community members, um, student voice, um, stakeholder voice in these spaces where we're working on this strategic plan to come through to the point where the board approved our strategic plan in June of last year, and then we've been um, full in implementation of the strategic plan since we started this school year, uh, which has been great. The amount of time that we spent leading up to this, and we did this work internally. Um, a lot of districts go outside and spend $100,000 plus on outside consultants to come in and run this type of work within the organization. Uh, we took it upon ourselves uh, and the leadership within the district to do this work internally with our own staff um, leading this work, which allowed us to be much more intentional um, with our community as well as our staff and our students when we're building this um, all through the last school year. So just to kind of bring you up that, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, I forgot. We'll go back. So we have four goals in our strategic plan. Um, and these goals have been something that drive everything that we do. This is what we call our North Star. So um, Simone Hamilton already mentioned this as our goal one. It's preparing students to be global citizens. For the longest time in this district and various uh, iterations of strategic plans up until this point, it was all about students to be college and career ready. And so looking at our student population, thinking about what it really means, this right here does not negate students being college and career ready, but it allows us to go a step further and look at students individually and, and what can we do and provide for them to be global citizens. So that's not just being ready for college and career, but that's ready for life. Um, that's ready for society. And so that was a big, uh, that was a shift for us, um, which was great. Goal number two, expanding student, family, and community partnerships. A big focus. We cannot do this work alone. We're not sitting in this room alone with just our own board. We're sitting here now with a joint uh, meeting with the City Council of, of Covington and because we can't do this work alone and how can we continue to partner and work together to meet the needs of our students and our families and our community as a whole. Building equitable systems in school environments. Again, this is thinking about our schools and our buildings, our spaces. How do we make sure that every, kids feel like they, every, or every student feels like they belong? How do we ensure that our, our schools are welcoming spaces for our families? Specifically, when you're talking about families where over 72% of them um, are, are non-white families. Um, it doesn't mean that they're all from uh, outside the United States. It just means that they have um, a different experience, potentially. 
and we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome in the Kansas School District. And then goal number four is investing in our diverse workforce and inclusive workplace cultures. So we've always had an, the goal around investing in a diverse workforce. As we've stated, we've shown that 80% of our, our uh, teaching staff um, is white and more than 72% of our student body uh, are non-white. That's always been a focus of ours in the school district. We've now added that, uh, the inclusive workplace um, as well. Looking at making sure that, again, it not only feels belonging for our students, but also for our staff and our, our families in those spaces. Each one of these goals have three um, areas of focus. And every single area of focus has a leadership action planning team that's assigned to them, um, ranging from four to seven members that meet on a weekly basis to work on each one of these items that are in black around that ring there. I won't read every one of them. Um, it, they are in the handout and, and they're on the screen as well. But these are our areas of focus this year. This is the work that we've committed ourselves to um, that will allow us to get closer to meeting the, each one of those goals that are identified in the middle there. Um, we have begun, uh, starting in December, sharing our updates with our school board and um, that's been very helpful. Um, to keep our board up to date on what we're doing, uh, whether it be through presentation or whether it be through a, a, a narrative executive summary of the update of that particular uh, leadership work group. And so um, that's been a, a, a great opportunity to continue stakeholder voice as well as um, uh, driving the district in the direction that we want to under Superintendent Bella's guidance as well as this five-year strategic plan uh, moving us in the direction that we need to go as a district. And so um, very happy about the, the growth and the strides we've made in that area. Talked a little bit about the boundary. I won't dwell on this. Um, we did spend, again, like, as I mentioned, you know, over a year um, looking at our boundary uh, change um, opportunities as well as the sixth grade moving up and knowing that we needed to um, uh, make adjustments. Uh, it's been, it, was, it was over 10 years since the last time we did a boundary adjustment in the Kent School District. We had several schools throughout the district that were um, over capacity or pushing capacity, and it was time for us to, to make that adjustment, and um, that's what we did uh, through that process. Again, um, we reached out to every single family who was non-English speaking individually to make sure they understood the impact to their family and their students, what schools they were going to go to. And I would say a very small number of students or families ended up in the wrong school the first day, and we were able to make those adjustments pretty quickly within the first couple of days of school um, to help them transition to the school that they were um, intended to be at. And some of that was through a communication gap. And others was they were just new to the district and they had just kind of slipped in and thought because they lived in that particular area now because that's where it was before. They'd been told by a neighbor and now they were in a different school. And so we were able to make those adjustments um, with little to no issue um, as we moved through that. So that is the boundary committee work. And the last piece I want to share is something that, again, this is the big piece for us right now in the school district that we're focusing on because we continue to live the strategic plan every day. So that's a focus of our work. Our equity work is a focus every single day. One of our big uh, strategic initiatives this year is passing a levy. We failed the 2023 bond in April for $495 million. Um, we turned around and came back out in November of 23 with our educational programs and operations levy, uh, which supports a lot of staffing and programs in our school. And we coupled that with um, our capital technology levy um, to address voter fatigue. If you've been in the Kent School District, and again, Covington, you're here, um, it seems like we're on an 18-month, two-year cycle. We're always on, uh, on the docket for a, a measure. And that can be really taxing on our taxpayers and community um, to always have something up to ask for um, community support. And so all along, it was trying to, to get ourselves in a, a space where we could go out three or four years and not have to go back to our taxpayers and ask for support around a levy or a bond. Fortunately, with the, the failure of, of the cap tech levy in November of 23, five months ago, um, we are forced now to step into this space in 2024. 
um, with a change in taxes as well, um, and to run our capital tech replacement levy coming up here in April, April 23rd, about five weeks from yesterday. Um, so I want to run through and make sure that uh, um, not only the board, but also uh, our city of Covington uh, council members are aware of the items that are on the, uh, the agenda for the uh, levy. The piece that I want to make really clear is that um, we've had community members asking why, why are they the same project buckets that they were for the bond and they were for the last levy. Even though we went out to our community and asked for input, what can we do differently, what can we do better, what can we do to, to get your support? Um, these levy projects are based on assessments that we do of our buildings, assess needs assessments. And so not only do our internal um, maintenance and facilities and operations teams do assessments of our buildings and we know when, when we need to replace things, we also have the state come in every single year and do assessments of our buildings. And so to answer the question, that people have of like, why is this, why is it the same list? Um, it's because those are the identified areas of need for the Kent School District at this time. And so when you see these lists, um, you'll see, you'll see that and you'll probably, it probably will resonate with you if you remember the bond or the levy that came out in November as well. As I said, we failed uh, the, the cap tech levy in November, uh, 643 votes short, um, just shy of 49% there. PDC guidelines, um, th those of you that all ran for uh, elected position, you guys all understand PDC. Um, things you can do, things you can't do. Um, and it's gotten a lot tighter in the last two years. Um, and so we walk a very fine line um, with our informational campaign that we share from the district and, and then uh, we really lean heavily on our community um, group to kind of lean in on the uh, get out to vote uh, work. So. Just quick timeline for you. Um, elections on the 23rd, like I said, uh, we're, we're, we're moving along. We're, we're moving along there. Health and safety are six buckets. Health and safety is the first one. Um, obviously, again, these are very similar items that have been on the, the last two bond and, and levies for this piece. Healthy air, ventilation, cooling systems, alarm systems, inclusive playground equipment, and school entrance additions. There'll be time for questions as well. If you guys have questions, we can, we can definitely answer those here in a moment. Um, so I won't, I won't dwell on all those. Boiler replacements, again, we have a um, master facility plan for every single school. We know when things are running out of their lifespan and when they need to be replaced. Um, <clears throat> one thing we called out on this, and I know that uh, Mill Creek is not in Covington, but we called out Mill Creek in this particular case uh, because of the ongoing and annual flooding issues that the Valley sees specifically in that particular area with Mill Creek Middle School being in a floodplain um, right there. And so um, unfortunately the students at Mill Creek who are, it is uh, again our most um, uh, impacted middle school in our school district uh, rarely have access to that field and that track at any time during the year because of rain. So that's something that we're, we're really focusing on there. Um, flooring, as that comes up all the time, and we've got to address some things at both at our central kitchen and transportation uh, fueling center. Technology is part of the capital and technology replacement levy. We can't do the work that we do every single day um, in the district office to support our students as well as in the classroom that our teachers and our paraeducators, office staff and building leaders do to support our kids as well as kids and their learning if we don't have access to technology. Um, when we have the, 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 the capital and technology levy passed and working for us, we usually refresh our um, devices for our students every four years. And so um, that's, uh, this technology levy allows us to continue that uh, refreshing on that particular cycle. We also have other pieces of equipment in classrooms that are used by students and teachers that are running to the end of their life cycle. Um, and so we need to address those as well, as well as uh, internet connectivity. So almost anything and everything our kids do um, and our teachers use in the classroom uh, has to do with technology. The subscriptions that we pay for so our kids can access uh, things and our teachers can access things uh, are paid for out of the, the technology levy. Um, Skyward Canvas, uh, most all of our staff and students function on that every single day. 
We've got some modernizing of infrastructure that needs to be addressed. Um, phone systems, uh, we're running phones in our, a lot of our buildings that have been there longer than I've been in the district of 20 years. Um, we've got voice amplification systems that need to be replaced. They've run their life cycle, intercom systems, disaster recovery things, just things that we need to do to make sure that safety, which health and safety are our number one priority in this district, are taken care of uh, and addressed. And those are covered by the capital and technology levy. And of course, there's a, a chunk of uh, that levy that also supports uh, professional development and growth um, for our teachers to be able to support our students. As society changes, so do the needs of our students and our staff. And um, AI, I'll just call out that piece, uh, that came in like gangbusters the last couple of years, and now it's, in, it's here, and it's here to stay. And so how do we educate our staff and train our staff to be able to utilize that? Because the kids will learn how to use it faster than the staff. And so how do we make sure we keep up with that? Um, so it's, it's a benefit to the organization and the growth of our students and adults. April 23rd, ballots are going to drop um, right around spring break. Um, which is that second week of April. There you go. Any, any questions on that, on that presentation? And I also have, before we get into the discussion piece, I, I will share responses to the questions that the city council asked as well. Uh, so I, I do have a question, and no, it is not about boundaries, I promise <laughs> everybody. That's all right. Even if it was, I'm, I'm all good. So... Talking about flooring, I, being at Kent Lake every day, I'm pretty sure the flooring is the original flooring from 1998. Is that the flooring that we're gonna, you're going to be replacing with this levy, or s at least part of it, possibly? You know, um, I've got Dave Buzzard here, who's our executive director of capital, um, and or op operations, sorry about that. I forgot. <laughs> Position changes, title changes, role responsibility changes. Um, I can't speak to a specific project, but I can say that flooring will be addressed in many of our buildings that have flooring that is over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. I can't say right now, and we're not gonna, yeah. we usually don't try to call out specific projects, but I can say that you're over 25 years old. If it truly is the original flooring, it's probably somewhere on the list. Yeah. And I'm seeing a head nod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just another question, because I keep hearing Skyward is going away, but it is on the levy. Is, are, is it a new version of Skyward, or is it a? Yes. Okay. It is. It is. Um, the Kent School District, uh, as well as all other districts in the area, have had opportunities to kind of step into the, the, the older brother, older sister version of Skyward, which is the newest iteration of Skyward um, called Cumulative. And so several districts around us have been transitioning over the last four or five years into that, and it's our turn to do that. So we are literally like three quarters through our um, pre preparation for that, and we will be transitioning this summer into the beginning of 24-25 to cumulative. Yeah. Great. I love it when I can give a presentation and there's not a lot of questions. We lend it to other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. There's plenty of time for discussion. You can ask all the questions you want. You're up, Regan. It's all you. I'm do it from up here, but I think I've got to click this. You got a clicker right here too. Was it not working? I'm going to come down there. It's just that had to be done. Oh, gotcha. So we thought we'd try something really cool and high tech with this Prezi, and then we were asked, "Can you print it out for us?" No, no, we can't. So. I apologize for that. Uh, if you'd like a link to this, I can share a link with you. So, yeah, I guess. <laughs> you'd think you'd be able to print this, but um, thank you, uh, Simone and Wade. That those were great. Um, there's a lot to share about what's happening in the city of Covington, um, but tonight I just want to take a few minutes and talk about really um, the growth that's happening in Covington because that relates pretty importantly to what happens here in the Kent School District and some other things that, that relate to, uh, to the school district. So first, we'll hit, get right into it with growth in Covington. We've got two new multifamily projects. That's uh, 330 units 
coming online, <clears throat> three commercial projects that are coming in, <clears throat> two are uh, larger light industrial facilities and a dental office, and then uh, 12 subdivisions that are currently under review or um, in construction phases right now that'll be about 250 new homes by 2029. An important part of, uh, but separate than the stats I just shared, but of the growth in Covington is our Lake Point development. A lot of you have probably heard about this. It's a large 230-acre development. Uh, we did get new owners, Brooke Cal and, and Toll Brothers, our partners uh, on this project. It's huge. It's going to be up uh, just over, could be up to uh, seven, over 1,700 residential units and 1.3 million square feet of commercial space. We anticipate about 830 uh, units of single family and townhomes coming online between now and 2029. So from the last slide with the, the subdivisions and then what's happening here in the next five years, there's gonna be a lot of development happening <clears throat> in Covington. And that probably means a lot of new kids for the Kent School District. So these, as we plan and, and meet regularly, that's so important uh, that we're planning and understanding what's happening in each of our jurisdictions. Uh, Lake Point Boulevard, that is under construction. That was done in three phases. The first was 204th that went from Kent Kingley up to this project. The second phase was the intersection at 256 and Highway 18. And now that third phase is under construction uh, that goes th right through the middle of that development. So that's gonna change things too in the flow of traffic throughout the community as that comes online. SR 516, our Kent Kingley project. Uh, this is from Jenkins Creek to 185th. Uh, this has been a, a big project. A lot of you, you know what growing pains are like. Uh, this is a growing pain for us. Don's twitching over there. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, this is a $21 million project. Should be completed this year. Uh, so we're excited about that and we'll widen that area to five lanes. Really what it does is it moves the bottleneck a little further east. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So once we get this done, we're hoping yeah. that the closer it. we get to Maple Valley, the more they'll want to come um, yeah. on, on widening that. So, but it, it, it's a good project. It needed to be done. Uh, it's, uh, we had to remove some culvert for fish passage. Uh, we're working to develop a trail that will go under that uh, bridge we're putting in and should be a, a great, um, give great access, pedestrian and vehicular access throughout the community. So next here we've got uh, a lot of what we've done the last several years is really increased our open space and our parks and our trail system. We, we needed to add quite a bit of capacity to our inventory for that and so we've been doing that talk about a couple of them. This first one is Founders Park. This is a downtown neighborhood park. We, we were short. I'm not going to go that long, Jeff. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just brought it for you. This yeah. is mine. <laughs> I brought but, it for you. Oh, thank you. I might. So this is a, this is a great project. We, the city purchased five parcels there right across the street from uh, the old Covington Elementary School. We don't call it that anymore. We call it our town center site. But uh, th this is going to be wonderful access for a downtown neighborhood park. We've got a lot of people moving into that area, multifamily coming in there, but not a lot of great access to parks. So this park will be also be a trailhead to connect uh, through that project we just talked about, go under 272nd and up to Jenkins Creek Park. That fa we've got phase one uh, const uh, being constructed right now, should be completed really soon. And then we're continuing to work on, on some future phases for that park. But it's looking great. If you ever drive past it, you can check it out. So again, that trail will lead up to Jenkins Creek Park, which has been in the community for a long time, but has not had, I, I was going to say not had good access. It's really had crappy access, to be <laughs> quite, quite frank. Um, there's just not, hasn't been a great way for people to travel to that park, try to, try to park, and then uh, access it. So we were able to purchase almost two acres uh, right there by the roundabout there. And, and this project is, is underway that will really create that main entryway for Jenkins Creek Park. And it's a beautiful area to go and kind of disconnect and, and escape from it all. So construction on that phase will begin this year. So 
the public safety, as it is with the school district, is paramount in the city of Covington. It's something that this city council has really made a top priority. Some things we've been working on, because these public safety costs continue to, to increase and increase by millions and millions and millions of dollars over the last just couple of years, which is a big hit and really unsustainable uh, for a city like Covington. So we've been trying to do, what are some other things we can do? And one of those things is SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. We brought in a trainer, we trained our police force, we trained a lot of our planners and in our community development department so that we can really integrate um, SEPTED principles into, into our development and, and what we do. That picture there is a, a good example. Um, unfortunately, Famous Footwear had a vehicle drive in through the doors, steal some shoes, drive away. Our officers went through some SEPTED principles with them. One of those was installing uh, bollards in front there. They chose not to do that. Um, uh, once it was replaced and all fixed, another car drove through, stole some shoes, and drove away. Our officers met with them again and provided those SEPTED principles, and they did them all. And uh, crime has uh, decreased dramatically at Famous Footwear. Right. So these are, um, SEPTED is really low-hanging fruit kind of <coughs> stuff that, that we can do. And our police officers frequently are called by businesses, and they'll go out and, and really assess their property to say, this is what's needed. And then on the planning side, our planners are meeting with developers saying, hey, if, if you do this, this, these, these small things, they'll, make a, they'll have a, a large impact. We've seen, uh, since we really started our SEPTED program beginning last year, so about a year and a half, about 11% drop in crime in Covington, where the other jurisdictions under King County Sheriff's Office have seen about a 2%. So um, something's working. We hope it's this. There is unreported crime, unfortunately, that goes on that we don't know about, but for reported crime, it's down about 11%. However, we still need to pay for police officers. Uh, as, as the community grows, uh, we, we need additional officers and services. So uh, I would say, was it Sean, two years ago, we started studying um, public safety. We formed a public safety committee with the council. And out of that, part of that was we need to find a way to fund public safety because we just can't keep doing it at a general fund. Uh, revenue. So a B&O tax was discussed. Well, nobody likes a B&O tax, especially businesses. So we held a lot of open houses. Uh, we invited all our businesses to them. We, we walked around the city council to every business in Covington and gave them information on it. Uh, we did a, a survey with every business and had about a 25 to 30 percent um, uh, response rate on that, which, which was great. And uniformly across the board, other than one, and there was one that didn't, they said, if, if these funds are committed to public safety in Covington, we're all in. Uh, and that, that was a great message that our, that our council heard. And so this uh, business and occupation tax will go into effect July 1st of this year and really help fund uh, public safety. It's a 0.2% sales tax. There's a $250,000 threshold. So if you make less than that, you're not subject to the B&O tax. Uh, the council did exempt 501c3s, uh, except for hospitals that are registered uh, under 501c3s. So, uh, and, and they are committing that this will only be spent on, on public safety. So we're, we're hopeful that this will help uh, increase our public safety presence and the great community policing that's being done in, in Covington. So another thing, you're seeing quite a few uh, different taxes here. Um, well, uh, that's because we haven't had a tax increase other than a small 0.1% uh, TBD tax increase in, I, I know it's been over a decade. I don't know for sure when, when the last time that happened. So these costs, as they keep increasing, they increase and we keep eating it and eating it, our reserves, we keep using our reserves, and now we're at a point where we've got to do something. So that B&O tax is coming online for public safety. But then for transportation, that's important for the district, that's important for, for the community. So this is a 0.2% sales tax increase. Currently we have a $20 car tab, and that brings in between $350,000 and $400,000 a year. If you've ever done any work on infrastructure, you know that fills a few potholes. Like it, it literally, it doesn't do, do much. So um, what the council has decided to do on this ballot measure is they will, if it's passed, they will not collect it. 
until they repeal the $20 car tab. And hopefully what that does is incentivizes the residents in Covington to appreciate the fact that you will pay less per household on this 0.2% sales tax than you are with the car tabs. And the city will bring in about four times the additional revenue. So it makes sense. Um, these things need to be funded. And so Covington residents can pay for it all, or we can do this and everybody that comes and uses our streets and shops in Covington can help fund our streets. So that's the message. We have walking routes and we're all walking uh, around the community and, and talking with people on, on every door. And so uh, we're hopeful this will be on the August primary ballot. Well, I shouldn't say that. The council hasn't officially made that decision, but it will be on their agenda in April to make that decision to file. So a little bit about our Covington Youth Council. This is just a wonderful council that we started a few years ago. It's all Kent School District uh, um, students. And uh, you see six of them um, there. There's, there's more than that on the council. And they do incredible work. And if they're a reflection of what you're doing here, bravo. Because they're really great youth. A few things they do, they're intimately involved in a lot of service projects we're doing around the community. They organize service project. The youth council has adopted a, a street. They do two street cleanups each year. Uh, every year they go down for two days to Youth Action Days in Olympia. They meet with, with our legislators, they meet with other legislators, they do mock legislative sessions, and they always take our legislative, the city council's legislative agenda down with them, but they also go with their own thoughts and their own ideas, and when we hear from our legislators, they always love the youth council coming in and visiting with them and meeting with them and, and sharing their interests, and I think it's incredibly valuable. They also help out with our Covington Days Parade, and they answer letters to Santa. That's not an easy job, but they answer those, and it's, it's beautiful and wonderful, so uh, th they're doing a fantastic job. We love our, our Covington Youth Council. Another thing that gets our Kent School uh, District youth involved, engaged, and active um, with their family and loved ones throughout the summer is our Ready, Set, Play, and this is just an awesome program. Uh, it's, we create these brag badges, and each badge represents an activity. So it could be hiking, or riding a bike, or brushing your teeth, or making your bed, or making cookies. Wh whatever that activity is, a badge represents that. And then a business sponsors that badge. Um, we tried to keep it, it, it's about 300 bucks for a business to sponsor a badge. We wanted to keep it lower than it would be to, to put an advertisement in the newspaper. And this program is twofold. It increases foot traffic into your business and it gets kids involved uh, during the summer. So once the, once the, the child does that, uh, that activity, they can then go to that business and pick up a brag badge. And businesses will have you know, discounts and promotions for Ready, Set, Play uh, participants as they come in. So we had uh, this last year, 24 businesses participate in that. We had 550 lanyards, uh, multi-care sponsors are lanyards that were picked up and 179 uh, students that completed uh, the Ready, Set, Play program, which means they collected all the brag badges. We have a prize pack for those that complete. They get free swim passes, crumble cookies, gives them free cookies, uh, all the businesses that they contribute to it. So it's really great, and um, we hear from parents all the time that they just love it because they've got this built-in activity plan for the next month or two. So it's great. I know Jennifer, she, she's been busy with it. It, it, it's a lot of work, isn't it? it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do. So it, it, that's another great aspect of it as well. So I, my, my family and I, we've done it as well. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Athletics, recreation, aquatics. I have to say, first, we cannot do these programs like we do them without the Kent School District. So thank you. Our share use agreement with the fields and the courts make it possible so we can really provide these programs. It, it, you look there, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that we're serving um, throughout the year in these athletic programs. Uh, so thank you for that. You can see there we've got over 2,700 participants in our sports leagues, 2,000 in our, our camps and um, classes that we have going on, over 2,600 in our rec programs, and then over 132,000 water visits uh, at our aquatic center. So it's pretty incredible what's happening in our community and, and 
and with these Kent School District, are you one of them? Yeah, no. <laughs> there's, a, there's a joke going on about that aquatic center. Yeah? No well, we want to hear it. There's no joke going on. We are the fifth largest district in the state without a, and we yeah, have no yeah, pool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it being one of the most inclusive sports that we can do, and also one of the more popular ones, yeah. we still don't have a pool. But Covington well, does. Well, you do have a pool. <laughs> but Covington does. It. And actually, I'm really interested yeah. in hearing more because it's an aging pool. And it so is. What's the next step? I don't have a slide. Like? Yeah, I don't have a slide on that, but I'll talk about it a, a little bit. Uh, that's a really important thing that we've been focusing on, and the council had a decision to make: do we, do we put a lot of money into that? We it, we're at capacity. Every program we have there is is full, and, and there's and there's wait lists. So so the, exactly, and, and so and so that's difficult. Every program, not the swimming only. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> So, um, so do we do we put money into this because it is crumbling? Mm -hmm. it, it's an aging facility, uh, or do we build something new where we can increase capacity so that we can provide um, these kind of programs for for everyone that's seeking them in, in our region? Really, not just not just in Covington, uh, and and for the schools as well because Tahoma uses us also. Yes, we do. So, uh, so the council's decided we need something new. Uh, so, so we have uh, we're in a feasibility study. In fact, I just got an email today that's uh, that's completed. We'll be uh, presenting that to the council, um, and, and they've seen it as it's gone along, and they've selected different designs for this facility. We purchased the old Compton Elementary School site in part to put that facility there. So that's that's where um, that's where it would be located. It's a great location for it. Uh, it's just really really expensive to build. Uh, <laughs> you understand that, so so that's where we're at right now. We we know where it's where it's going to be. We know the programming that we need to provide in it. We've got some preliminary designs for the facility. We need to come up with eighty to a hundred million dollars. Uh, so one of the one of the things we've pursued is possibly a metropolitan parks district um, that we'd hope would take in more than just Covington. Um, and so that's that gets a little bit tricky. But um, if it takes in just Covington, that's, that's what, what we'd have to work on. So that's kind of a, a quick and dirty update <coughs> on, on where we're at with that. But for the meantime, we're doing every we can, everything we can to keep that thing running. Yeah. And it's running pretty well for a 50, 60 year old building. What's that? <laughs> yeah, gum and duct tape. So, uh, but yeah, great question. Thank you. So our student art show, again, this is something that our Covington Youth Council is, uh, has organized and, and really carried out. And all the artwork in this uh, program is from Kent School District students. So there's eight schools participating that we collected art from, uh, 10 businesses throughout the community, including City Hall, that are displaying the art. And we collected 592 pieces of art from your students. That the, that the youth council collected and hung in, in the different businesses. So it's really a great program. You can go to our website um, and pull up each business, each location and where the art is. A lot of families like to see that so they can go around and, and see the art from, from their children and, uh, and others. So that's a wonderful program. Again, that, that we just appreciate the students from Kent School District for, for doing this. All right, some community festivals and events. These are wonderful. I think what they do is they build community. They build a sense of home, and that's a really wonderful thing to have. We have, of course, our annual festivals of Covington Days and Kids Fest. We do three uh, summer concerts uh, that added our, our park that are really beautiful and great events. Five outdoor movies uh, that are fun, and we do them at the amphitheater there. They're really great. If you've got a free weekend, a, fr a Friday night, usually when we do them, come and enjoy those. They're, they're really a, a lot of fun and great. In those events, we usually get about 14,000 people attending those throughout the couple of months during the summer. And um, we just appreciate the involvement and engagement that we have uh, of the community and also from the Kent School District. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions that anybody might have. What's the date for Covington Days? What's the name? Date. Oh, the date. Let me pull up my calendar real quick. Don, do you have it? It's July? 17th and 18th. There you go. The third weekend. Jeff's always a lot quicker on this stuff than I am. There you go. All right. 
No, what, what dates did you say again? Uh, I think it's 19th and 20th, or 20th and 20, 20th and 21st. You're, that was probably last year's. <laughs> so July 20th and 21st, we'd love to have you. It's, and the council on Sunday passes out ice cream. <laughs> Come to that. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much. Okay. Moving on to section 4.01 and opening for any questions or discussion. Um, I have uh, four topic areas from the city council members. So um, I'll just address them. They, Jeff shared them with me and, and I've got some responses. <clears throat> uh, first one was around safe routes to schools. And so thinking about like uh, partnerships with the district and the city around uh, improving walking routes for students, uh, specifically like Crestwood, Cedar Valley, the Covington area there. Um, so in talking to my team, uh, we've had conversations with uh, Bob Ling Linskoff, yeah. yep, the Covington engineer, about looking at projects like this in the past. Um, it always comes down to, do we have the funds? Have we written it into a bond? or a levy um, where we can kind of uh, partner in that way um, because that's where, that's where the money comes from. And so I think in future, when we look at uh, bonds and we wanna be able to do projects like this specifically about looking at sidewalks, because if you think about uh, Crestwood was a great example that you and I talked about, um, that uh, we've got parents that are parking on the side of the road that are um, in the um, uh, shoulder and so kids are having to walk out around cars and um, as they're walking home because there's not a designated sidewalk, it's a shoulder. Um, similar to, to several other schools, not just in Covington as well in the Kent School District. And so um, looking at partnering maybe and doing some work around sidewalk stuff. So something that we'll have to look at as we move toward another bond the next time we go up for bonds so we can be intentional about um, putting money away for that opportunity. Um, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons um, another conversations and conversations we've had about this as well um, with the city of Covington about potentially partnering. Um, and I think continuing to have those conversations and talking about those specific areas and looking at what the cost would be um, and allowing us again, um, unless we have put it into a levy or a bond, we've got to find non-bond types of uh, funding to be able to support projects like that. But if we know where they're at, and we know what the price is, then maybe it's a conversation that we can have and see what that might look like. Um, I know the rapid flashing beacons that we put in around the district in various areas have been very helpful with slowing down traffic and alerting those that, um, that are driving through school areas during those times, and those are, are definitely a, a safety uh, piece for us. <clears throat> Middle school sports, um, this one was specific to, to baseball and softball, and we've got our director of athletics and activities here and I'll just share a little bit about the work that he's done and the data that he's collected because we surveyed all of our future middle school students. So our fifth and sixth graders last year before they came out to be sixth and seventh graders this year and about 4,500 students um, responded to the survey. And so um, trying to gauge their interests. As we all know, 2024 is different than 1984 and it's different than 2004 and so um, student interests around sports and activities have changed, sometimes away from the traditional sports and activities that we may know as adults that were in place uh, back when we were growing up or even when our parents were growing up. And so that's something that we're seeing within our responses from our students. And so um, in this particular survey, baseball and softball were very low interest of students in the school district. Um, and Regardless of that, it's important to know that whenever we had a boy sport, we have to add a girl sport. So much like other districts around us, Kent School District has struggled with Title IX and trying to make sure that we have uh, equal opportunities for both our boys and girls to access sports and that we want to make sure that we have an equal opportunity for students um, so the numbers are also equal. So if we have 500 boys turning out and we have 150 girls turning out, we have a problem with that and we have to look at what we're offering and how can we get more students engaged. And so 
um, that's definitely been something, especially at the middle school, which is why we brought in the intramural programs we did this year. Um, so one of the pieces as well is that um, uh, we, in the surveys that we asked, not only of our students, but our community members, we have a lot of <laughs> community members that says, hey, can we get swim for middle school? Uh, boys volleyball, which is uh, um, not uncommon anymore in neighboring districts. Lacrosse, um, girls flag football, which is something we added at the high schools this year, and cross country at the middle school. And, and they actually rated higher than baseball and softball now at the middle school level. And we haven't had baseball and softball at the middle school level in Kent for well over 10 years. Um, and so uh, hopefully that, I mean, I answer that question, but that's just kind of where we're at. We've just kind of go with the ebb and flow of our student interests nowadays. Um, we brought uh, badminton into the middle schools, which is pretty popular uh, with our students. Um, and so that's been a, a new addition as well. That's something that the WIA is looking at adding to sports uh, or adding it across the board as well. So, and of course, if you guys have questions about these, I've got the right people in the room to answer those. And the last question was about impact fees. Um, I think this was from Ms. Porter. Um, about collecting impact fees. And the bottom line on the impact fees, and again, we have this conversation anytime we go out for a levy and a bond, and we're looking at that, is as long as our enrollment in the school district does not um, rise above the capacity of our buildings, we're not, we're not able to collect impact fees, as we've been advised by our outside um, attorneys that specifically work with bonds and levies around impact fees. and so. There's a reason, I mean, we'd love to go out for impact fees. Unfortunately, with our enrollment has been declining, our schools are not at capacity and they don't give us the opportunity to be able to go out and leverage that. Um, and so that's why we, we don't collect impact fees or haven't in this, this uh, current cycle, so. And I have people here to answer any questions or get into the weeds of any of those Wait, pieces. Can I ask a, yeah. Is that because during, oh sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Um, it's about uh, the first topic, the safe Walking routes around. to schools. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can the district apply for grants, leverage any uh, opportunities there? That's honestly how the city does a lot of our uh, sidewalk improvement. Yeah, it's possible. We don't have like a, we don't have a person that specifically is, is assigned to go out looking for grants and things like that, but that's, if grants are available, that's definitely something we can look into is, I saw yeah, Sean I would highly recommend that. that given the the significance of safe routes to school. I mean, I, I would say that that's a very high um, high risk item to 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 not address um, in a, in a way that ensures a kid doesn't get killed on the way to school. Like you said, parents parking. Um, on the shoulder is is a real issue. We see it all the time at our in our local Covington schools, and um, one kid would be too many to, to take that gamble with. So I, I would definitely recommend looking into um, alternative ways, not just relying on one funding uh, pathway for that. Yeah, we spend a lot of time assessing the walking routes as much as we possibly can to ensure that they are safe. Some are safer than others. Um, again, we're we're constantly assessing those based on student and parent or family input on whether or not they deem those areas to be safe rocking routes. And then we try to find alternative pathways or walkways for students as well. Um, ideally, you know, we would be, we would have a lot more bus drivers to pick up a lot more of our students so they wouldn't have to walk in the spaces that families may deem un to be unsafe. Um, we also have situations much like uh, Jeff and I talked about at uh, Cedar Valley as well as Crestwood and several other schools that are in the uh, non-Covington municipality that we have families that are parked all along the sides of the shoulders and so any kids that are trying to walk to and from school when kids are especially at uh, pickup time at the end of the school day, um, they have to either walk in the ditch or they have to walk out in the road to get around the cars who are lined up that are kind of parked on that, uh, that white fog line in some of those cases. So definitely understand that um, but I appreciate the, the guidance around grants and looking into that. I'm sure we can, we can definitely dig into that. Appreciate that. So I just wanted to piggyback onto that is, because the sidewalks and safe routes to school was my, one of my big things. As a parent of a student at Crestwood uh, who picks him up 
from school because for some odd reason my second grader doesn't want to ride the bus, but <laughs> he's going to have to learn next year. Uh, the idea for sidewalks is was one that came from the visit that Mayor Wagner, myself, Councilmember Saltis, and Councilmember Member Porter, uh, when we went to Crestwood last year and spoke with fourth graders, that was actually a topic that the fourth graders were bringing up to us. And it was one of those that I don't think are the city minds looking for those grants, but connecting with the school district to sign on with it, there's more power in numbers where we could do it together, where the city can look for it and we can both work together to write those grant applications. Uh, there's probably a better chance for us to get some money out of that if it's showing that numbers going that we're out. Um, so that would just be my my suggestion is, I, I know Bob is very busy, but I know he likes talking about building things a lot too. So I'm sure if there's someone here at the district who wants to talk about building things, uh, <laughs> did, I am looking at you over there, Dave. Uh, I'm sure that finding Bob could find some grants and we can work together to get the wording correctly. So That sounds great. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy to partner. I just chime in too, and I'm sorry, I, I can't seem to find the raise hand function. Um, this is kind of the thing I was asking about with the impact fees. I, I wanted to just be clear that in my head, it is strictly for buildings. It's not, it couldn't be used for sidewalks. So for example, a sidewalk in front of a school or a direct route when we have a new um, development, say, going in that's not that far from Crestwood, part of the sidewalk is not built, right? So even though enrollment might be down, per se, we are going to be having buildings coming through, and we're going to have a need for additional ways, safe ways, for kids to get to school. So impact fees only for an actual building or classroom build, new build. Correct. Not for any uh, structure, infrastructure that would support increased residents that have kids. I'll, I'll ask Executive Director Dave Buzzer to answer that. I, I don't have that answer, um, and if he doesn't, we'll we'll find out. Uh, yes, thank you for the uh, question. Yes, uh, that is correct. And then for impact fee, it would just be for what the district currently owns. Again, having a grant. Uh, for a safe walking route, the city would own all the right away for that. So it would have to be a joint venture. Uh, the school district would not be able to build something on city property without some type of MOU or an agreement that said we would get into that, um, that <coughs> process. So when it comes to impact fee, yes, until we get to a point where our enrollment uh, uh, substantiates the need for unhoused students uh, for us to be able to put kids back into every space that we have for capacity, we would not be able to do those uh, impact fees. And as far as I know, and I can verify that with our um, uh, attorneys that we uh, reach out to, we can definitely get back to you on the provision for just building or infrastructure is included. Great, thank you. And I guess the other part to that too is that, like in the last few years when we've had this plan come through, at our city council meeting for support, it's a six year plan. But as I'm reading more about impact fees, they, there's 10 years to spend them. Uh, what happens, like, it, does it make sense to hold them, in a, hold them because we know eventually we're probably going to need them? And or what happens if they don't get spent? Do they just go back to the developers with interest or what does that look like? I will double check with that, but I believe that we have not done that. Um, but I will get you that information. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, a lot of it's been touched on. Joe mentioned the, about the grants I, the, in partnership. It's really, it's really in the matching funds where, where we could be more successful in securing uh, grants as if uh, both jurisdictions were contributing to matching funds. That, that's where I think we could be successful in, in grants for safe routes. Uh, and then on, on the capacity, um, the ability with the impact fees, I think Beth touched it. I was just curious if that was the reason post-COVID is enrollment down, and that's why. And I saw that number, it was 25,000. I think it used to be 27-ish, maybe, 28? Yeah, so um, uh, right before COVID, our enrollment started to drop. And then, of course, COVID definitely uh, 
didn't help us at all, and we didn't get back the students that we thought we were going to get back. So um, we're, we're down about 2,000 over the last six years. So. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. So a couple. I um, appreciate the um, response to the, the council's concerns. I, I kind of wanted to go into a little more detail on some of those. Um, one of which related to, to public safety. Um, we've heard from some of our students, it's not just the physically getting to school, but it's actually physically being safety or safe at the schools. And so um, there, it, it, you know, it, it, it's anecdotal for us, but it, it isn't uncommon to hear about uh, fights at the high schools quite often and students not feeling safe or secure in their learning environment. So, I don't know what the solution is to that, but I know that that is a perception of some of our schools, that it is physically unsafe in, in some of those facilities. So just something, and we're hearing that from our, our students, so. Uh, and then another big thing we, we heard about, and this might help some of that, what I just mentioned is a lack of a consistent activity bus, um, that it's consistently canceled, uh, and that is, for multiple reasons, but it impacts equity. Um, obviously, students that don't have access to a vehicle or parents that can't drive them, they're basically shut out. And we've heard that consistently from our students as well, that this is one of their top priorities is a consistent activity bus. Um, so some way we can address that would be, would be I think, appreciated by them. Um, and then uh, I appreciated on the, I think it was one of your strategic goals about other ways to get students involved. And I appreciate Regan mentioning our youth council. You know, any way we can partner to continue to promote that because um, we're always having students graduate and we're always needing to bring new students on. And I, uh, it's a, a great way for uh, young people to get involved with their community and, and to the person. It would be interesting if we could bring some of those school board in to see some of our interviews. Some of your students are just unbelievable and their commitment and want to volunteer and make the community better at 15 years old. I mean, I, I mean that's just incredible to see how passionate they are. And I know it's more than just the 10 that we have. So any help with that would be, would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and then finally, I forgot to mention on the on the public safety with the beacons. Um, I know uh, there's been some um, a learning curve for some of our drivers. They're not used to those beacons being there. And I know our chief of police is committed and willing to send our officers out to remind people that those beacons are there and that they need to slow down or stop. Um, so if you're seeing things like that, that people are parking on the right of way and making children go on the street. We need to know about that because that's obviously not safe and more than likely not legal as well. So um, please let us know. Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, let me answer. Um, I took down the note about the fights at high school and kids feeling unsafe, so I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, I don't have an answer other than the fact that, you know, our, our building leaders and our staff are aware of those, and we try to create cultures in our schools that everyone feels safe and, and welcome and belonging. But we also know that yeah, any given day, kids show up with a lot of stuff that's going on and, and some make choices to, to do things that are, are unsafe for themselves as well as making others feel unsafe and that's unfortunate, um, no doubt about that. Um, activity bus piece, yes, we offer um, and we have offered an activity bus to all of our high schools and all of our middle schools and depending on the need, um, usually identified through um, building uh, administration, including probably the athletic director, especially at those schools, um, about students that uh, need access to an activity bus, then we've given them an activity bus. Now, as far as cancellation of an activity bus, as soon as, as, soon as we have a, a driver and a bus and we have less than three or four students that'll get on that bus, then it's not cost effective any longer in that particular point. Now, that being said, we also are looking at some other alternative um, uh, arrangements for transportations for kids in smaller vehicles that are not full-on school buses that cost a good amount of money for a CDL certified bus driver and the bus and the gas and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, we are working with some outside um, companies as well that can provide vehicles and spaces for us to be able to get kids either in vans or in cars to get them to and from spaces as well. So we're working on some partnerships right now to increase our ability to address things just like that so kids aren't feeling like I don't have access to after school activities and I can't get there um, or I can't get home. Because that's important. We don't want kids to feel like they don't have access to what we're, what we're trying to create as part of the whole school experience at any of our schools, especially at our, our secondary schools. So I appreciate you sharing that. And then I think you're right on with the youth, count, youth council partnership. In fact, one of your youth council members came to our last board meeting um, and spoke very eloquently about um, uh, the interest of kind of leaning in on the board, asking when might there be student representation on the board again, since we've had it before, but we don't have it now, um, as well as just student voice, which again, as you mentioned, it is one of our main things up there uh, for goal number two around creating opportunities for student voice um, within, not only within the classroom, but within the school and the organization as a whole. Um, so that's a very big piece. So love to partner with you guys on your youth council partnership as far as when students turn over as well as engagement and partnership on, on their voice into the work that we're doing um, and what they're seeing and hearing out there. That's, that's an important voice um, as we try to improve every single day here in the Kent School District. So appreciate that. Going back to the activity bus, um, we all serve regionally on different, co different committees to ensure that the local community can be heard and that we are promoting our communities. One of those committees that I serve on is the Regional Transit Committee, which is with King County Metro. And this year I'm the vice chair of that committee with uh, King County Council Member Moscata as the chair. And we all know that trans transit, public transit is here to stay and is needs to grow in this community, especially in Covington. One thing that I know that is not done is I know Kent Lake is in Black Diamond technically and technically unincorporated King County and I'm sure they'll fight over who actually has control over it one day. But there's no public transit to get out to Kent Lake. That can change if the school district would like to fight with me, uh, or join with me to fight with King County to get, the, get them to put that out there. And we had, just had a meeting today, so the next meeting's not until April 17th. But if, this, if the school board would like to find ways to get public transit out there, it might help to alleviate the needs for activity buses when you consider that all of those students get to ride for free, and it would be a benefit not only to the district, and it would be a cost-saving measure, but it would be a measure that would definitely bring people around to understanding what's going on uh, in our communities and finding ways to be more equitable when it comes to getting our students, or getting our students the abilities to ha participate in those activities. Completely agree. I'm gonna, I'll let Dave speak to this in a second after I get my 10 cents in before he gets his in. We've been beating this King County drum for over six years um, because to exactly your point, um, the fact that our, our Kent Lake kids especially don't have access to things because there is no public transit out there. In fact, we uh, working with Heidi Maurer, principal at Kent Lake, and just pounding the pavement when King County about the need for a route and, and working with them and then trying to find access to, okay, fine, we fought you for three or four years and you're saying that you don't think that's justifiable, there's not enough to justify having a route out there, which like, well, we could fill a bus with our own kids any given time. Um, and then going the route of working with our transportation and Dave and working with finding ride share opportunity. I mean, so I'll let Dave speak to things. But you know what? I have no problem standing right next to you and everybody else who's out there about getting that because our kids have access to a free ORCA card for Metro. There's no reason why. You can't tell me that there's not enough people to ride the bus out there in that area that could access a bus if we did a route. I mean, we Covington and um, uh, Kent Lake, Birch Creek kids come all the way through from Kent out through Covington all the way out to Kent Lake and most of those kids don't have access to being able to access the activities that our schools provide. Um, and so that's why we try to find as many alternatives as we possibly can because 
that's not okay for us to not have access. And so I'll let Dave speak to how much we beat up King County and how much we'll continue to do that. And now that we have an ally, we'd love to do that with you. Yeah, back to Dr. Berenger. Uh, Joe, sign me up and sign uh, Justin Dennison up, my director of transportation, our director of transportation. Uh, we will go with you wherever you need to go um, to voice our concern. I did want to point out there is a pilot program that has not started at Kent Lake yet, and it is through the King County Metro Transit Department, and her name is Julie Burrell, B-U-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And what it is is that this has been, we've been trying to get this worked out for almost a year. What it is is that when COVID hit and everybody did not drive rideshare vans from wherever to Seattle, there are hundreds of these vans sitting in multiple parking lots all over the state of Washington. They would give us a van, pay for the gas, pay for the insurance, I believe, pay for the upkeep and maintenance. We would just have to have a verified, qualified driver, and then that person could take multiple trips back and forth from Kent Lake. That was the pilot program that is still active right now, but there's not a lot of movement because there's a lot of things that need to happen before that starts. Would the driver need to be a Kent School District employee? No, it could be a parent. Yeah, that's right. Really? Yeah, yeah. it can be anybody as long as they have a valid driver's license. And yeah, it's, it's Justin Dennison and Heidi have been working with Julie and her team. Um, it, I guess it's been almost a year. Um, it's it, to get traction takes a lot of hoops. Sure. Who, who insures the driver? That's a great question. That's something we haven't gotten to all the way to that point yet. So uh, I have a little bit of an update on that. I, as <coughs> Joe serves on one board, I serve on the South County Area Transportation Board. And yesterday um, we met and King County Transit was there and they were talking about their their lack of drivers. And mm -hmm. so in, in uh, Black Diamond, they canceled their only route and they can't find anyone to fill the need. But anyway, what they're really pushing right now, and we heard this for over an hour yesterday, was their van pools and their ride shares. And the, as you said, they've got the van sitting all over. They will, they will give the van to a driver. They pay for the gas and the insurance. You have to go through about a two hour training. So they were talking about this at, for the business need. And I asked the question, would, would that work for a school districts after school activities? Because we're lacking that in, in Covington and um, Kent School District. And they said, they. They believed it would, and they took a, a action item to get back to me on that. So, Joe, I hadn't had a chance to update you, but it's um, it, it may be the the perfect um, solution because I think we do have parents. Uh, Jennifer mentioned she would even drive, but we'll yeah, the city council will take care of it. <laughs> yeah. So the vehicles are there. If there are parents that will drive, and they just park them at their home, they have to have at least five people um, to get a van mm -hmm. so I, I think that we could fill that need right. so we will update you both joe and i can update you as we learn more about that that's great yep just let us know i had a couple comments uh for okay moving on to additional topics um we so far tonight we've talked a lot about equity diversion uh diversity uh representation within our communities um, for both students within school districts, but then also community-based partnerships, um, and I guess just their experiences living within different cities have a huge impact on their development. Um, one thing that I was curious about, and I guess this goes for any city that we're gonna be working with, is in terms of the inclusive practices, what is the city of Covington doing to incorporate more voices? Um, one of the things I wanna reference is the recent house bill that passed. Um, the nothing about us without us. Um, specifically talking about if there's any policies regarding individuals with disabilities, that there's somebody with a lived experience on a specific board to help guide that conversation um, about what inclusivity looks like within the community. Um, is this something that the city of Covington has considered, especially for our um, higher needs populations? Want to talk about the equity issue? So we, go ahead. So the council a couple years ago um, created um, um, the Equity, Cultural, and Social Justice Commission, 
and, and that commission is tasked with all the things that you just mentioned. Um, as far as, as the bill that was just passed by the legislature, there hasn't been any policy changes in Covington as far as that's concerned. The commission has been working. It's, um, they've, they've tried their best to put together a strategic plan and some other work and they've participated in all of our events and we continue to recruit uh, to add more people to it. But the voices that we've had on there have been good voices and they've been diverse voices. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a brand new commission, so it, it's got its ups and downs, as any new commission does. Uh, we modeled it after uh, City of Renton, and when they started theirs, it took probably three years to get it up to full force, and they've got a strong commission, so we are anticipating. So if you want to spread the word about, we're happy to look for more commissioners. Uh, we've got about seven or eight openings on that mm -hmm. commission right now. So, it, uh, so we can get it built back up again. Okay, yeah, and then with that, um, in relation to public safety, um, I, I sat on multiple boards and action groups, um, and most recently, prior to joining this board, I was, I was on Inslee's uh, Disability Rights Committee. And so one of the data pieces that we were looking at prior to me um, serving, my, serving out my term there was looking at the data on law enforcement and their interactions with students with disabilities. Um, with the city of Covington, um, not just within public safety and law enforcement, but just throughout all city-run organizations and departments, are there additional trainings or support that you guys are providing to your teams in identifying more inclusive and socially just ways to interacting with some of our students? So with our, um, our police officers, we are contracted with King County Sheriff's Office, so a lot of training is done through the King County Sheriff's Office, and it's extremely extensive uh, for those needs as needed. Uh, as far as inside the city, we have training going on. on a I, I'd say in the programs that we provide, right, we, we're different than a school district in, in that regard. In the programs we provide in the services, uh, of course, th those are there when it comes to infrastructure and ADA ramps and those kind of things. Those are, Don and his team are continuously working on those, um, when we put in a playground, we made sure that it was ADA accessible and the zip line was and, and those sort of things. Is that what you're talking about? No, more what so with interactions. Um, uh, a lot of my experience is coming from inpatient over at Seattle Children's and working in the emergency room. And a lot of the things that I see, especially with our um, high need populations for children who are neurodiverse, suffering from various mental illnesses. Um, I've had plenty of interactions with King County Sheriff and multiple different police departments. Uh, and so one of the common topics that keep arising um, is related to what does a training and oversight look like for those public um, responders? And what are various cities doing to address a lot of the gaps in understanding how neurodiverse students see the world and operate because some disabilities are invisible. Um, and so as a county, as a city, with um, a lot of our students who exist with these identities, what are some of the actions that are being, um, I guess, discussed or considered? Uh, as far as in the police department, that, that's all that training is provided by King County. So everything that King County has provided, our officers have that. Um, and that would be the extent of what's, what's been provided. Is there any effort to push beyond that? No. I. We haven't had those discussions internally. None of this has, has reached us at all. Quite frankly, I don't know exactly what, what you're talking about and how we'd implement that, but mm -hmm. we'd love to hear more about it. Uh, nor has anyone ever brought it up to anyone in the city, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I would say that our um, interaction, our programs, uh, like Regan said, like Regan said, are um, aimed at our entire community. Uh, all of our residents. Um, so we have kind of multiple ways that we interact with our community. And uh, I'm on the Puget Sound Regional Fire Authority Board. And one of the things they've recognized is that they had a number of calls that were non-fire related, non-emergencies. And it was, uh, as you can imagine, runs the gamut from people's cats being up in the, the trees to people being lonely to people having a... Uh, uh, 
mental health crisis. And they've created a program called FD Cares, where they now actually have licensed social workers um, that when the fire department goes out and identifies that this is a non-fire, non-medical emergency, um, they will roll their social workers out and work on getting that person the support that they need. So I guess to answer your question, we don't have specific programs for children, but we are partnering with other agencies on providing those services uh, broadly across our, our community, but are open if there are ways to partner and make our, or help our public officials be more aware that there is a need in, in, the, in certain areas, so. Are you talking about mental health? I'm just talking in general, because when we think about the city and when we think about when our kids are utilizing um, community resources, right, community centers, um, walking down the street, using public restrooms, um, oftentimes um, situations can occur. Um, perhaps one of these children might run into an experience where they're being harassed and due to their mental illness or other disability, they may not react appropriately. Um, so then law enforcement comes out, then they view the student as the aggressor um, because of the information that's readily available at the time. And so um, I know for one, the city of Tacoma, they work heavily with many um, mental and behavioral health agencies in identifying ways of how do we partner with other um, city-run organizations to provide trainings. Like how do you, to teach you guys, how do you identify when somebody's in crisis? Who do you call, when to call? Um, and then offering and making sure that even staff members within public spaces are educated and aware of what these disabilities are and what the resources look like. Yeah, so I, I would say, like, like Sean mentioned, with our community care specialist, that person does have training in that regard and our police officers. I, I think it was, you talked about it in a roundabout way, which was difficult to understand specifically what you were asking. Yeah, yeah, just more so, is the city doing something to implement something within the city um, to, to help address some of these crises that, that we're seeing? Um, just because I'm seeing this being implemented in other cities, so I'm just curious to know what Covington's doing. I just told you. Yeah. yeah. No, no, sorry, it's just reiterating. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the third one that I had, sorry, this is my last point, um, was also with the rise in um, a lot of the controversies and topics around um, gender inclusivity um, and creating some spaces of belonging within the city, such as uh, in public parks. Um, are there any discussions or uh, thoughts about introducing um, gender affirming bathrooms or gender inclusive restroom or spaces within those. Uh, when we think about like our students, especially during summer when they're out engaging in public activities, um, are some of our more marginalized uh, student populations, do they have spaces to also engage and interact? Of course they do. Everyone can engage and interact in everything we do in the community. Right, but do they have the spaces where they feel safe and supported? Do you mean like their own restrooms and changing rooms? Sure, that being one so of them. The direction that, that our, that would be at our aquatic center. Mm -hmm. The direction they've been, been given that if, if someone who identifies as a different gender than, than their birth uh, wants to use the facility, the locker room or change room of, of their gender identity, then uh, we, and people in that space are not comfortable with that, those people have to be removed so the person identifying can then use that space. Okay. Using our clock that is three minutes fast, yeah. I figured that we still have probably time for one more question and then closing remarks. In follow-up to um, the discussion topic, one thing that we learned last week, we met with our youth council, and they had a number of things, and I think you know we talked about a couple of them this evening, but one of their concerns was at the schools, they felt a lack of changing rooms. So I think Mayor Wagner has given the, the list of those priority items on, um, but I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's kind of a, a, a need in, in both the schools and any place where there would be uh, changing activity. Um, in, in terms of restrooms, no, the city doesn't have any gender specific or um, have made any changes with restrooms, but we did hear the concern from our youth council that um, they felt that there should be a need in, or that there should be changing rooms available in the high schools. So 
um, I think we're, we're hearing that also. But thank you for bringing that up. And I, can I just add one more thing? I know that it's it's kind of it's a challenge for retrofitting certain buildings, but when we're looking at designs for new buildings, such as the Aquatic Center, that was a consideration that we brought to them just to ensure that you know, we can look at what those options might be to include it. So we, we do look at new projects with that kind of a lens as well. Great. Well, we are going to move on to 5.01 and 5.02, closing remarks, and I think I'm going to kick us off. Um, there was a comment made earlier, um, and we talk about community a lot, um, but I just liked the reminder of being in community with and um, it being an active relationship and, um, and, and not just kind of a passive of where we belong. And, and I think that having meetings like today and that active partnership of being in community with each other um, is what makes us better and stronger and um, challenged and hearing new things and um, looking at the things that we do in, in better and different lights. So I um, appreciate this time that we have with the city of Covington. Um, love hearing about the activities that are happening. Um, the 500 pieces of our students' art being displayed. Um, the ways that the business community, um, who is the... Um, you know, next step, right? And that's what we're preparing our students for is how do they participate in the community and um, are active in, in the communities that we belong. So um, it's just exciting to hear uh, what is going on with the city of Covington. And I just appreciate you taking the time and being here with us today and the questions that you've posed. Um, Dr. Berenger? Ditto. Um, no. <laughs> plus uh, one. Uh, plus one. one. <laughs> that's right. Plus one. Um, no. Thank you again uh, to the <clears throat> council members of City of Covington and joining us. Appreciated the presentation. It's nice to hear the dialogue and, and the um, sharing of the same passion that we have for our students, that you have for our students that are within Covington, as well as the families and the community that you guys serve as city council members, and we serve as district employees and staff. So we definitely have that connection. I appreciate. Um, the engagement back and forth and and providing information on things about you know we may not have bond and levy money but we don't need that let's go out for grants together there's other ways to be able to fund projects like this to be able to support those public safety pieces that are a benefit to our students and our, our community as a whole so appreciate and look forward to the opportunity to partner um, on those conversations and then um, finally um, <clears throat> Appreciate the uh, Youth Council. Jeff shared the information with me last night. Uh, we did talk about a couple of those things. I do have responses, and I'll get some more responses so I can give those back to Jeff so we can share that with, this, uh, with the uh, Youth Council. I'd love for the Youth Council to reach out because that way I can work with them to, to be a liaison back to our schools so we can uh, support their questions and concerns in our buildings so our building leaders can help address some of those as well if they haven't been addressed. Um, so we can continue to work together that way. So, again, encourage city council members, community members, students and staff in Covington and the district to uh, reach out if they ever have any questions about anything. And um, make sure that, you know, if there's opportunities for us to partner with you, like Joe saying, stand beside him for King County <laughs> Metro, well, we, we definitely are interested in those opportunities. Sometimes everything's moving so fast, sometimes things pass by us and, and if you think there's an opportunity that we're not standing next to you in, please let us know so we can assess um, the value of that and, and be a partner with you guys in this work. So, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I really appreciate the partnership we do have with the school district. Uh, I really enjoy hearing everything. Um, I'd like actually I'd like to sit down with each of you individually um, over coffee to talk more about different uh, aspects and uh, hear what's going on thank you to the school district team for being here and uh, Don and Regan and council I really appreciate you being here as well and Beth to log in remotely and I know I've said this a lot but I really really appreciate your um, 
security team and what they do, especially for what happened, I know it's been a while, but for what happened out at Kent Lake. And so not only the partnership with the city and the school district, but the partnership that your security team has with local law enforcement, city of Covington, King County Sheriff's, Kent Police even showed up out there. Um, I think it probably ended well because you were out there as well, Dr. Berenger. Uh, but uh, so it's, I'm glad that the outcome was what it was. I'm sorry that it had to happen. And I just hope that uh, the school district and I look forward to the partnership that we continue to have. So thank you all for being here. And look at us being very timely at 8 o'clock, and we are now adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.